Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another interesting webinar organized by LanguageCert in collaboration with ELI Publishing. As I usually say to, to teachers before a webinar or seminar, dear teachers, this is your time, your training time, and therefore simply enjoy this moment. The title of this webinar is LanguageCert Young Learners ESOL Exam Fox and L and mapping it to the Story Garden series by ELI Publishing. Let me introduce myself. I'm Giuseppe Romagnoli, brand ambassador of LanguageCert here in Italy. And together with me, we have Paolo Giuliani, business development manager, Italy and Malta. Hi, Paola. Hello, Giuseppe. Thank you. Good. Uh, would you like to say something about this webinar, Paola, please? Yes, I would just like to thank Joanna Paninelli, who's now, you know, um, an affectionate speaker for LanguageCert. We're always yes. happy to have her on board. Hello, Joanna. Hello. Lovely Good morning, event. Joanna. Hi. Lovely to be here as always. And, you know, Joanna is a brilliant speaker and also she teaches us a lot about inclusion and how to improve our language certification, which, you know, we, we can never value enough. Um, I would just like to say uh, uh, just a few things about Fox and Owl, our young learner certifications. I think, uh, you know, they stand out from other young learner certifications because we really, when we devise our certifications, we really strive to minimize stress in assessment for young learners. Uh, you know, I think that's an effort um, that's really important when you, when you, when you assessing, uh, you know, children between nine and 11. So thank you, Giuseppe, over to you. Thank you so much. I totally agree with this idea of minimizing stress and making it a nice experience for especially young learners. More and more teachers, headmasters and parents are aware of the importance of starting learning a language at a very young age. And we find that more and more teachers at primary schools, especially here in Italy, but all over, are asking for more and more ideas and tips on how to make their lessons more interactive, fun, and also somehow targeting towards objectives. And this is where the Young Learners exams comes in. Um, so on that note, allow me to introduce you to, and Joanna has already been introduced, but introduce you to Joanna Paulinelli. Hi, Joanna, again, good. <laughs> Joanna is a Director of Economic Development and Innovation at the British School Pisa and is the ISLI, L'Associazione Italiana Scuola di Lingua, academic coordinator. She's particularly interested in using her experience, technology and new ideas to ensure that learning and teaching English are accessible to all. Her teaching combines digital technology, innovative methodologies in order to make the classroom a place where everyone can learn. Joanna has an MSc in Psychological Research Methods a master's in educational psychology and is also a qualified Italian Dyslexia Association tutor. She is a teacher, trainer and speaker on inclusive teaching. She regularly co collaborates with book publishers and exam um, boards such as Language Search. And we've, been, we've been doing this for quite a while now um, on um, dyslexia and how to make language learning more accessible. Uh, Joanna divides her time between working with children with special needs, training teachers in her school, as well as traveling all over Italy, and we know that, and not only Italy, um, working with state school teachers on teaching methodologies and students with dyslexia. Her training sessions on innovation and methodologies are aimed at making education more inclusive, flexible, and above all, as we like repeating that, exciting. So. Let's get into today's talk. Joanna will be giving us, as we mentioned before, some tips on how to prepare for language search, young learners, ESL exams, OTML, and also how to use Story Garden series and some fun activities. Joanna, over to you now. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, Paola. Thank you, Language Share, for giving me another opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and today, yes, I'm going to be talking about the Young Learners exams, and I hope to give you some ideas you can actually use in your classroom and just show how preparing for these exams can create an inclusive and fun learning environment. So off we go. So uh, I'll start with looking at some fun and inclusive tips for the speaking exam, and then I will move on to the written exam. Um, which includes listening and reading and writing. And then I will look at some preparation materials. 
All right, so let's start with the speaking exam. Now, the, the Fox pre-A1 level is a five minute speaking exam. And so the very first part, uh, the interlocutor really makes the child feel at ease, which is extremely important, and asks some simple personal questions, because we know that children, they do like to talk about themselves, so do adults. But it's nice to start with these easy questions. What's your name? How old are you? Just to get, just to make them feel at ease and move in to the second part of the exam. Now, the second, the second part of the speaking test, the children are giving a picture card and the interlocutor points to an object and asks some questions. For example, here we have an elephant. What's this? Do you like elephants? And so on. Now, the third part of the exam, they're given another picture and the interlocutor describes the scene. So for example, in this one, the children are having fun, they are playing tennis, and then he or she points to the objects or a person in the picture, an animal, and asks some questions. So for example, what, what's this? What color is it? What's the woman wearing? Now, if you notice, the question, what's the woman wearing? It is in the present continuous. Now, here in this level, they don't need to be able to produce the present continuous, but I find that it's a tense that children find quite easy to learn and teaching them this tense allows for so many classroom activities which children can enjoy, especially using images and scenes. All right, now, um, after the, the, this part of the test, um, they are asked more questions, which are in the context of the previous questions. Now, this is important as this way you can prepare the students by working on different topics and doing the speaking activities in the context of the topic, for example, sports and hobbies, and all this puts the language into context, which is, which is very important. Also, it is more inclusive. Now, I really believe that um, over many years of, of teaching, um, I believe that working on each part of an exam by doing specific activities related to a part, not only improves students' English, but it also gives them an, an objective and also gives the teacher clear goals and a structure for them to follow. And if these activities are fun, then that's even better. All right, so let's start with some ideas. So the first part where, you, for, where, for example, you're asking, what's your name? Okay, I like to do some chanting. So what's your name? My name's Joanna. Like little chanting questions and answers or clapping out the syllables. What's your name? My name's Joanna. I bet you do these things already. Or singing, making them sing the, sing the, the, the I'm not gonna start singing at the moment, but doing singing questions and answers whispering and then getting them to shout the questions and answers. All these helps improve their memory and, and then also are more inclusive because the more that we do all different things, singing, clapping, whispering, shouting, all these things, you just practice the language and it remains in memory. And a, a little activity that I like to do for questions and answers is putting children in a circle and they form a chain. So the first child asks the question, what's your name? My name's Joanna. And then, and then the next one asks a question, they move on and they ask all different questions and answer them. So that's a nice little activity. And what I often do is I create an interviewing scene where I give them like a microphone because in my classroom, I have realia of every type. So they have a microphone and they have to practice interviewing their classmates. Also, the teacher um, can use flashcards, as I said, to introduce the objects and just keep lots of reality. Don't throw things away. Keep whatever you want to throw away, take into your classroom and use as real realia to help them improve their, their English. Now, obviously, many of these activities can be done in the digital version, um, which also brings, brings a lot of excitement because we know that young people, young children today, they do like a lot of digital versions of activities. So many things that you can do here. Now, I find that learning vocabulary to do these type of tasks is often quite a challenge in English, especially for students that have an L1 in a Latin language like Italian. And also English is a phonologically deep language and it's got so many different words for the same, so many different sounds for the same letters. 
So I like to use inclusive tools such as maps and schemas to help their memory. Now, if you can see here, I've got a schema for to display, which has been done for clothes. So that's the one category, clothes. And the other one, I have a concept map with the category, the um, animals or the zoo, and then put into subcategories. Now, I always, with young children, um, and even like up until the Scholar Superior, I always, um, I always say to use concept maps and not mind maps, because mind maps, you've got something in the middle and like all information, and it's not very clear. The categories are not very clear, because I always say that the more the categories are clear, the more that the students can remember what's in each category. So I would really suggest using concept maps. And yeah, so this is these are inclusive tools that you can use with all your students and they help, they help everybody's memory. Also, some memorization strategies. Now, memorization strategies help to make connections between what we know um, and new pieces of information. And this helps to create these memory anchors that stop information from floating away, a bit like boat anchors. So this is an example. So I would give my students a picture, all right? And I would tell them to look at the picture. And then I would get them to close their eyes and imagine that a kangaroo had lost its way. And instead of being in Australia, he was in the North Pole, right? Then I say to them, what do, what is the, because we have to try and guess what the word is. So I say, what do kangaroos do? They jump. So the word is jumper, because you had to put the jumper on because it was cold. So these little things can really help. And getting your students to close their eyes and imagine images for vocabulary can help. And of course, the more funny the, the image, the better that they remember. Another inclusive tip is now very often remembering words in a linear order, okay, for example, January, February, March, April, May, does not help memory in the sense that students remember the first, the beginning and the end, and they lose the information in the middle. So for, for vocabulary such as days of the weeks, months, even the alphabet that comes up in, in the exams, I use non-linear schemas. So as you can see here, we've got January and February at the top, the summer at the bottom. So in a non-linear way, and I always get them to close their eyes and see the image that I'm giving, and this is important. And very often to even reinforce this, I get them to describe the emotions that they feel, for example, how this always is, I always get the same answer. I say, how do you feel in the yellow months? And they say, oh, the yellow months, it's the summer. And they always say happy because there's no school. So there we are. So emotions can also improve memory for words. And categorizing the grammar. So one of the most difficult, so also obviously you're gonna be doing questions and answers. So I like to, to teach them how to form the questions. Although it's not required at this level to be able to ask questions, I find if you teach them in, in a really clear way, the students are able to ask each other questions so much easier. And I like to use CASI, the question, auxiliary, subject, and infinitive, and give them this with clear categories. And very often I'll bring students up to the board and I'll make one student like the question, one student has like an A auxiliary and they have to move around and form the correct, uh, the correct question. So these are all nice activities to use. Now, here we have, now I use a lot of images and a lot of videos. And there are many videos on, on YouTube with games and songs. And I'd like to show you this, um, it's like a, a picture game for children on adjectives, but on animal adjectives. So I'm just gonna play a little bit of the video. So could anyone guess what animal this is? Let's see if you're right. <laughs> Well done. 
So you can use this task where you ask them to guess the animal. But from these video, but you can actually create more activities in your classroom. For example, in this video, you would get them to guess the animal, but then they can do it vice versa. You can show a picture of the animal and they have to use the correct adjectives. Another activity, you can put them into groups and give each group different um, animals to describe. And then the group chooses the adjectives. They stand up, they give the adjectives and the other group has got to guess the animal. So this is a nice activity and all, so there's so many activities from videos that you can move, that you can uh, modify and you can do speaking activities and then, then they can, afterwards they can maybe write down um, the adjective to describe an animal and draw the animal. So many things and starting from the video, you know, it does help them to be more motivated and concentrated. All right, now, um, one of the books I use, I'm going to be talking about today is the Story Garden series. Now for this level, for this exam level, um, it's the Story Garden three and four. Now the thing that I like about the Story Garden is that many of their tasks do include speaking, speaking activities and many are songs. I love to sing, so I always get my students singing. And this is a great way for learners to use the right pronunciation, listening, vocabulary, grammar, you know, songs do cover a lot. And in the book, there are like the sound games where they have to use, correct the pronunciation, play the game activities, chant, uh, chatting time where they have dialogues and they have to act them out with a friend. Um, the back page of the group of the book actually has where students have to complete the phrases and writing their personal information. And I always adapt this into a speaking task, speaking about themselves. And again, also the interviewing um, technique that I told you about before. And my favorite is the acting out the story. So the students can at, read the stories, what do the activities in the story, the listening activities and everything. And then they can actually act out the story. And I am a strong believer in using drama in the classroom. In fact, with my students, we do a lot of theater and storytelling. And this was like remote data that we did during the lockdown, uh, where the students in the class were acting out the story to students who were actually in Gaza. So it was quite an, an a motivating and, and, a, and a emotional experience for them. Now also the Story Garden works on life skills, life competences, and this is important. We're doing a lot of work with life skills on even from the age of, the, of young children. Uh, it's important for them to understand themselves, understand their skills and questions like, what can you do well? They really help them to understand, understand their strengths and their weaknesses. So this, this is, I really do like the fact that Story Garden also addresses life skills. Extra material in the book is like flashcards and the lap book where they have to create, cut things out. Again, motivational for children. And um, extra material that I like to use in addition to the books is also Twinkle, which is a, like a, a website that has a lot of flashcards and extra material that can help them with their exam preparation. So we've covered the speaking, we're going to go on to the written exam. Now, it starts off with the listening, and that's 10 minutes. And I'm going to go through it. Now, before I go through the, the parts, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about TPR, which is total physical response, as I use it a lot with my students to increase listening comprehension. Why? Well, it's based on the idea that learning is more effective if it's, a, if it's a whole body experience and not just a mental exercise. And, you know, they've done research and it's shown that it does create this neural link between speech and action. So instead of having them sitting at their desks, you know, if you can get them to stand up and act out the language they are studying, it can help them learn, learn the language. And also uh, research has shown that it helps deep learning and memory. So I use TPR almost all the time with my young learners, but also with my adults, because they do like it. Um, this is a little activity that I do now. This is like a miming song activities. And uh, here um, I wrote down some words for a song. And then from the, I took some screenshots, I've downloaded some images um, related to the words. 
And I get them, so I get them to read the words and do the actions, see, light. And then we listen to the song. And while we're listening to the song, they look at the images and they do the actions. Now, this is really good because they're seeing the words, but they're not seeing just the image. They're not seeing like the image of that word. They're seeing the image of the action. And it does really help them and they enjoy it. And it does create that emotional um, learning environment because whenever we do these things, I always pick quite nice and my moving songs with the children like. Um, so that's one activity. But then sometimes I, during this activity, I will ask the students, what activity, what actions they do for specific words. And we draw them on the board or we download them from the internet. Um, another activity with songs is to put them into groups and then you give them the lyrics of a song that you've all, you've probably already studied, studied before. And then you get them to mime a part of the lyrics. So one group maybe um, mimes a uh, verse one and the other one maybe mimes a chorus, right? And then you play the song and the students can stand up and they can mime their parts. And it's, it, that is another exciting um, activity. And the same with stories. So the students or the teacher can read out parts of the stories and the students have to mime uh, the story or vice versa. So these are miming songs and stories I really do. Um, I really do think it, they are great activities to do in class. So let's have a look at listening part one. This is a task where they've got to listen to a dialogue and then they have to they have to click they have to choose the correct answer now let's just see to you how we can use total physical response with such a task to make it a little bit more exciting because we do like the word exciting so for example here we've got clothes now i said to you before that i have realia in the classroom so i always have clothes in the classroom and here very often we have we can do a little acting out a scene uh, or maybe they have to touch the they have to listen to the dialogue and then they have to touch the correct item of clothing. But you can also act out a scene in a shop or a market where you can develop that task and, and they can buy a t-shirt and here it is, five, five pounds, here, here you are, thank you. So from that listening task, you can create also a speaking task. The same with the next one. You have to choose the correct uh, food. And here, you know, you can bring out realia um, and you can get them to choose you know, point to the one um, that's the correct one in the listening. Uh, and the same with the next one, which is objects. I mean, you can, you can even bring in, put the objects into a box, okay? And they listen and then they've got to, so they can't see what's inside the box. And then they've got to touch the objects and they've got to choose the correct one that they've heard in the dialogue. And the same with, um, you can do that with miming as well. So you can have, um, you can bring three students to the front and they have to, so they listen to the dialogue and then they have to mind then they all, what each one is miming in action. So for example, cycling or driving a car and the students have to choose which, which student is doing the correct action. All right, so these are just like little activities for listening part one that can really, that can really um, make a, a difference in the classroom. Now in this part here we've got, um, so here we've got a scene and we have a dialogue grandma here are some pictures of my friends in the school playground. Oh, that's nice. Which one is Frank? He's the one in yellow shorts playing football. He loves sports. Oh, yes, I see. So it's a little dialogue and it's nice because it's got lots of colloquial language in it as well. And then they have to choose the correct image for Frank. Now, how can we make this a bit interesting? Well, they can listen and they can mind playing certain sports or they can put on the correct item of clothing that's in the listening. Again, realia. They can listen and mime different types of hair, long, short, curly, and mime eating fruit uh, and things like that. Or you could have two or three students miming similar situations, again, at the front of the classroom, and the students have got to decide which one is correct. Now, I like to use words that are similar, for example, frog and dog, so they have to you have to mime a frog and a dog just so they can get used to listening to the difference in the phonological sounds. All right. And one of my favorite things is to have a picture with a scene and uh, the students have to describe, uh, the teacher can describe a person in the scene and the students go, go to the picture and they have to point on the picture. And then as they get more confident, the students could actually take turns in describing. And this really does help their 
there's listening and speaking skills. Because remember, listening and speaking, you know, are very in combination with each other. So you can always adapt a listening activity into a speaking activity and vice versa. Giving you a lot of information, but obviously, obviously you can go back and you can watch it, things again and, and take notes. All right, so this is listening part three, right? So they've got an image and they've got to choose, they've got to write in the correct answer. Now, this is quite tricky because they've got to, you know, they've got to write in the words. So obviously, I mean, um, but the thing is that because it's going to be a name or a number, um, that you can really work throughout the year on this, on names and numbers. Um, that way, students with a bit of disadvantage when it comes to writing English are also included. I like to teach the alphabet song. Um, I really think that's a really nice, uh, for, you know, all different songs. So getting them to invent an alphabet song is nice. And then giving children a letter, okay? And then when uh, maybe the teacher sings a letter, they have to they have to hold up the letter, and and the teacher can spell different names. They have to hold up their letter. And also the, the children with the letters can then come to the front and stand in the correct order for the word. So that's nice as well. Again, total physical response. The same can be done with numbers. So number songs, either easy arithmetic. So you give them numbers and they say, okay, two plus three, and then they've got to hold up the answer. All things like that are really, really good. And then that can develop you know, into writing practice where the, the teacher puts letters and numbers in a bag and the, and the child has to go in and take a letter or a number and they've got to write it down or you can give them a bingo card and they have to they have to cross off the the the, the what, what they've extracted from the bag so lots of interesting activities here too if we look at story guarding and how the books prepare them for the listening tasks well i think it's quite interesting because uh, there are so many exercises with listening. So first of all, there's always presentation of vocabulary and grammar with listening tasks, where they have to listen and point, listen and sing, listen, listen and play. And then they have to produce the language. Um, so this is really, really good. That was like a guessing game and they have to listen and play. And then, as I said before, this, I mean, it's called story gardening and each unit closes with a, a story which consolidates grammar and vocabulary. And it works on colloquial expression because it's so important for children to learn a colloquial and authentic language. And in the language share young learners exam, there is a lot of this. So you're teaching students from a strong, from a young age to use authentic language. So they have to listen to the story, sing the story. So it's, it's extremely, I think that the story garden for this is a, is a really good um, book to use. So, Let's move on to the reading and the writing. Now, this is 50 minutes and it's uninterrupted, all right? And, it, and it's, so it's reading and writing together. So if we look at the first task, here they have got different images, okay? And then they have to connect the image with the correct word, all right? So onion, and they have to put a line and connect it. Now again, using images, now you can, so whatever you do in your classroom, um, you know, using images can help in so many different parts of the exam. And also, as I said, images um, really do improve students' memory. All right, so let's see what we can do here. Um, so you could get students to read the word, they, so you can give them cards, okay? And they have, to, they have to read the words on the cards and you can put up images around the classroom. All right, and then they have to look around the classroom and go and point on the images. Again, total physical response. Or you can actually hang up a washing line in class, all right, where you put the pictures on this washing line, all right? And then the students maybe have the words uh, and they have to go on, they have to go up to the images and they have to pin, they have to, they have to put in the image on, peg the image, the, sorry, the word next to the image. And that's quite a nice. And you can just leave these washing lines up in the classroom each week, use, maybe choose a different category of vocabulary and use the washing line. Again, a box, and they have to like feel around the box for the matching object to the word. So you can put maybe some things in like classroom objects into the box and they've got to search for the pen. So they go in, so they've got the word pen and they've got to go in and choose the right word. So. Some more and, uh, and miming the word again, 
giving them words and getting them to mind. So as you can see, I do use a lot of this total physical response. And you can give them cards with images and then they have to like just color all of the items that are written on their cards. That's another interesting activity. Now in this one, again, they have an image and they have to write if the statements that are written statements are true or false. Now this is, you know, if you've been practicing with images, this act activity comes natural to them, absolutely. Um, so, you know, you can make, you can, you can put an image up on the lean or you can put a poster up in the classroom and the teachers can make statements about the posters. Um, and then what they can do is maybe they can give true statements and incorrect statements. So you see, okay, if it's correct, you can stand up. And if it's not correct, if it's incorrect, just stay sitting down or they can shake their heads like this. Okay, so this is again, using movement. Now, obviously in the exam, the students have to read their own statements. So you're not gonna have the teacher reading out statements. So I like to do it in stages because um, reading is quite difficult for young learners. That's also because of the fact that it's, it's such a deep language, like I said before, phonologically deep language. So you can maybe, show the statement and read it, and then get them to read it, read it slowly and the children join in. And then eventually you can ask the students to read it. So step by step. And again, you can even transform these reading activities into speaking activities. Um, so you can put up this, an image or a picture on the lean or on the classroom. But, and then you can give all your, bring out all your realia. And the students um, have got, I've actually got to use the realia and mine, mine things from the, so you don't show all the students in the classroom, the picture, sorry. You show, you give it to a group of students and then they have to use props and mime out uh, what they see. And the students, they have to describe what they're doing and describe the picture that they can't see, but the, both the students and then the group are, are uh, miming. So that's quite a nice activity. Part three, they have words and they have to complete the sentences, okay? So this is again, you know, starting with activities at this level, they, as they move up into the other exams, as they move up into A2, B1, as they move up, it's still the same type of task. So you're getting the students prepared from a very early age of what they're gonna to have to do to reach um, success and certification. All right, so here you have, the thing is, it's a little bit more difficult because you've got five gaps and seven words. So, the, so there are two distractors and you have to train the students to understand that they are going to be instruct, distractors. So it's a little bit of metacognitive tools here. You've got to tell them what to, to look out for the distractors and like why you got, I always get them to maybe tell me why this word is correct and why this was a distractor and why they didn't use it. It's nice, even in their own L1 language, sometimes I will get the students to describe in, in Italian why they have chosen this answer instead of another answer. All right, so I mean, an activity, you could actually give uh, seven cards with the letters on to seven students and, they, and you get them to come to the front of the classroom and maybe you as a teacher just write on the blackboard the first statement and leave a space. And then the student that has that word, holds it up and then you can actually get the student either to stick it on the, black, the whiteboard or they can actually write it. So again, more um, from, um, TPR activities. All right. Um, okay. And the distractors, I always get them. If I've given them out cards, I always get them to, to fold them up, to, to scrunch them up and then put them in the bin or put them in a folder, um, a class folder that we have at the end of the game. So they actually, you know, they remember that they've got these words that they've got to throw away. Because sometimes students get just confused with the distractor. And even, um, you can even make it more interesting that you can give them actual images to use uh, for the words that they've got to put up for, on certain images in the story as well. So you can, as I say, there's a variety of things you can do with all of these tasks. Now, part four is another scene, another image, right? Where they have to look at the image and they have to write in the answer. Now this is a bit tricky, but again, it's, cause, it's consolidating all the work that you've done in class. And, and all the work that you've done with images. And if you do it prop, if you do it in, in a way that's inclusive, they don't have problems. Even students with 
with learning differences do not have problems with this task. All right, so what can you do? Again, um, you can ask questions um, about the picture or you can actually ask even questions about the classroom scene. So you can ask them questions, yes or no questions or ask them um, to use some, some phrases to describe the classroom, you can start there. And then again, you can prepare cards with the, with the correct answer and an incorrect answer. And the students have got to decide which is correct and which is incorrect. And again, stand up if, they're, if they've got the correct card. And they can read out the, the sentences and they can mime. I mean, it's always the same type of activities, but one thing that I like to use for things like this task where they've got to use the prepositions um, are the quizzing ear rods. Now, I'm sure that in most schools you have these, maybe in the maths department, but I really like to use these to do things like prepositions, like that would be in front of, and get them to move, move them around. So that's another really good um, tip to use in the classroom. You can use them for um, comparative superlatives. You can put the, you know, the, the tallest one and then the shortest one. All right, just more ideas for you. So let's look at the reading part three. Now, as you can see in this part of the test, they have sentences of a reading text and they have to complete it with specific words. Now, what is interesting in this task is that they have two extra words, which are called distractors. So you have to get the students used to this type of this type of activity and used to um, knowing which are the, distract the distractors. So that way, when they get to do this in the exam, they know exactly what to do. So again, there are different activities that you can do. You can um, have seven words written on the cards, and then you choose the children to come to the front of the class. The teacher writes one sentence on the blackboard and leaves a gap. And then the student with that correct card can either stick it on the board or write the word. This is like an easy activity. And the two distractor cards can actually be take, scrunch, scrunched up and thrown in the bin. So the students see that these two extra words are to be thrown in the bin and not used. So this is an, an interesting activity. And also these exercises, you know, they do really improve the vocabulary um, in general. And again, you can, you can make you can make writing exercises out of these activities and speaking exercises out of these activities, like I've said, um, like I've said before. Now, here is another task, reading part four, where they have to, there's a scene, another scene. So again, using a pictures, using anything to do with pictures and describing a scene and everything that you've done before in the speaking and the listening tasks with images can help your students with this task. Now, it's slightly more difficult because they have to actually write the words. So little tips, what you can do here is that you can, um, you can uh, get, the teacher can ask students questions about an image uh, or about a poster before, like as a, as a warm up, And then they can, the teacher can create cards with the correct sentences on and incorrect sentences. And the students have to decide which are incorrect and which are correct. And very often I get the students to do this task in their L1 language. So they're actually talking about in Italian, for example, in this case, why the sentences are incorrect and why the sentences are, are correct. And they can actually argument the, with each other because I sometimes put them into groups and they've got to decide together which is incorrect and which is correct. And this helps metacognition, learning how to learn. Now, the story garden has got lots of reading activities because, I mean, the reading part of the test, it does test the range of students' vocabulary. And also interesting in this book as there are sections on CLIL and living English, and there is a word list at the back of the book. So all the vocabulary needed is in the word list and you as teachers can create um, you can create topics and you can create the schemas and the, and the maps, like I said before, for each category. And yes, they also test the range of grammar and all this is included in the Story Garden books. Now, the first part of the writing activity is to write three sentences about familiar things and topics. And again, if you have, you, if you have prepared the students for the other skills, this is really not difficult for them. And if you split your lessons into topics, then you know, they will be able to recall the vocabulary and this is not a difficult task for them. 
in this task, again, you have a picture and the students have to describe the picture. So um, they, by the time they get to do writing part two, they'll practice describing pictures. And what I do suggest here is um, that you can, the teacher can help to build, like to, you know, like just build up this task very, very slowly. So you can start off with preparing cards with words on them, and then the students have to use these words and construct the sentences and then write their sentences in their book. Or you can give students the words and then they have to stand up and they have to put themselves into order and create a sentence and then write it down again, more TPR. All right, now, I think um, the most difficult thing to do with the writing is to be able to sequence um, the, the adjectives and nouns in the correct order, because very often they are different from their L1 languages. So on the very first day, I, I always have this up on the classroom, but I get them to write down this sentence. So the black cat is walking slowly down the road with um, and I, it's explained to them that the colors represent, for example, red represents nouns and the green represents auxiliary. And throughout the year, these are the, 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 the colors that we're going to use for these, for these forms of language. And, and I also use cuisineer rods again, and I get them to put the cuisineer rods in order of a sentence like this. And then they can actually change the sentence. So instead of the black cat, the brown dog is, is perhaps eating. And they can just use the cuisine rods and they can brainstorm sentences and write them down. And this makes writing in this type of task even more interesting. Now, there's one thing that I'd like to share with you. Um, in my experience working with students, um, especially even students with learning differences, they are always taught to underline or to highlight keywords. This is because if you underline something or highlight something, or, um, it, does, it does remain in your memory. And often, I mean, I've done it before, you know, when you mark students' homework, you sometimes underline the mistakes or you circle the mistakes. Well, if you think about it, it's quite, um, it's just not very productive to do marking in this way because they are more likely to remember the, the incorrect forms. So during the last few years, I've actually started giving them video feedback where I choose some, some, some of the general mistakes that they make. And then I, in a video, I, I talk about the mistakes and I give them the correct an answers in this way. Or something I've done recently is that each week I create a correction code with my class. We decide on what symbols we want to use. So when I mark their speak, their writing, instead of like underlining and things, I actually use the code. So if they're, if for example, the verb is wrong, I'll put v, and if perhaps the spelling is wrong, I'll put sp, and that way they've got to think about the mistakes that they've made, and then I get them to correct the, their writing homework. So that's another tip that I would like to give you. And something that I have started using as well recently is, is a technique to help them with these final phonological difficulties in English. The fact that, you know, the, the words don't, the letters don't really correspond to the sounds. For example, here we've got cloud, okay? So you would think that it would be, it would be spelled completely different. Um, so what I've done is I say to the students, so think of an image in your L1 language. You know, think of a, an image that is an A ah sound and an O sound. And they came up with A ah for Angelo, which is angel, and O for unicorn, unicorno. And they use these images to remember, to, and they put them underneath the letters to remember the sound cloud. And the same for book, O, unicorn. And, and in their classrooms, we start to build up a lot of images to go with sounds in their L1 language. And this has really helped them to just to deal with those difficult words. I mean, we know what the difficult words are. And eventually, the more they use this technique, they will actually um, not need to use the images anymore. And they will remember, um, remember the, the, how to read the words. So this is just a little tip I'd like to give you. Now, we don't have time to go through um, each part of the OWL exam, but I'd just like to show you the, the difference here that the speaking is very similar, but it's actually instead of five minutes, it's seven minutes. And then we have the listening, which is 15 minutes, and the reading and writing, which is an hour. And again, it's very similar, the format. And a nice thing that Language Art has um, prepared on their website is a range of preparation material. Um, for young learners. There's lots of like sample tasks, sample papers, but then also there's the vocabulary list 
um, for every exam. And that really does help because you can use that to create your, your categories and, um, and your schemas. And then it's got a, a grammar syllable, syllabus that shows you all the things that have to be covered in the exam. So this is nice and it's available for free on the website. So I think I've covered all the main issues of the exam. And again, I'd like to thank you, Language Cert, for inviting me to speak today. It's been, it's been a real pleasure, as always. It really, really has. Joanna, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it is hot, isn't it? So Yes, it is a bit hot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to going to the beach, all of us. Yes, we are. But hopefully these are some tips that you can actually watch the video while you're at the beach. That's a great idea. That's a great tip. <laughs> In the summer. Another tip. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It really has. It's been inspiring. Uh, lots of useful information. I like the idea of the human approach, the friendly approach, as you said at the beginning, minimize stress and finding ways that they can experience by playing, having fun, um, memorization games, categorizing, um, you know, authentic language, emotions. I've just took some notes and I think they're Thank very you useful. To you I to absolutely me. always listen to your presentations right. and you're inspiring. So um, I would, Paola, would you like to add something? Yeah, I just you wanted to thank Joanna, who's, you know, she's always brilliant and inspiring. She's, you know, she's a fantastic speaker. And I would like to thank uh, ELI, for you know providing us with such great um material we're great fans we're huge fans of the story garden we think it's really a fantastic book for for young learners so you know thank you eli for for allowing us to use your material thank you okay. i've just got a couple of questions how uh, joanne i think that you've covered all the parts of the preparation of the exam etc how long in advance uh, um you need to book an exam that's for you paul i think um, first of all, you need to book your uh, young learners' exams at an approved language search test center. You can find all of these, um, you know, all of the our partners' name on um, the language search website. And you know, basically, one of the differences between our exams and that um, and those of other um, exam body uh, exam bodies is that you can book a young learners Fox and all throughout the year any day of the year, uh, you need to book a little bit in advance, but not that much, uh, 10 days max. So, you know, it's really a flexible um, provision that we have. Is it a uh, pass or fail exam? No, it is not. And, you know, uh, Joanna will agree with me that this is really the best way to, um, you know, uh, assess young learners, don't you, Joanna? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because they can't, I mean, it's important that they, you know, they can't, it's not a fail, they're not going to fail the exam. And that, and I think it's a really nice aspect of the young learners' exams, absolutely. And, um, sorry, Paula? No, just to say that basically children are awarded, um, let's say, a certain number of foxes or owls, depending on their performance. So, you know, they always get at least one fox and at least one owl. Yes, yes, okay. Would it be possible to take the exam in a state school? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, please have a look at our list of, um, you know, te approved test centers and ask your test center to organize a session at your state school. Very easy. Well, ladies, uh, that's all I have. And I'd just like to say thank you very much. Uh, buone fere. Happy holidays. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Paola. Thank you, Language. Thank you. thank you to the marketing and events team that supports us always is in these webinars. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Rafaela. Thank you, everyone. Bye, and have a nice summer. Thank bye you. Bye.